the Health and Human Service Committee will come to order. Uh, we do have a quorum, and Representative Olson moves the approval of the minutes from February 27, 2018. Are there any additions, corrections, or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption of the minutes from February 27, 2018, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion prevails, and the minutes are adopted from February 27, 2018. Uh, let's see. First up on the agenda today is Representative Dean. And he is up front. Representative Dean moves that House File 3062 be re referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Representative Dean, we have the bill before us. To your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I do have an A1 amendment. I would like to adopt the A1 amendment. All right. Uh, Chair Dean moves the A1 amendment. Representative Dean, to your amendment. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair and members, this just adds the uh, Board of Directors for the University of Minnesota Private College Council to the other academic institutions. It's a minor change. Appreciate uh, the adoption of that. All right. Are there any questions to the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The amendment is adopted. Representative Dean, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing this bill this morning. This is a pretty straightforward bill that will allow uh, Minnesota schools and uh, undergraduate colleges to apply for, accept, and spend federal grant money on opioid awareness. Uh, this bill aims to get at upstream demand for opioids and let young people uh, know the dangers of opioids uh, before that uh, they are offered a prescription or an illegal uh, drug. Uh, this bill is budget neutral. Uh, we were applying for federal grants uh, within this. DHS uh, will have to report to the legislature uh, by next September uh, the status of the update of the implementation of the grant program. Uh, some examples might be opioid awareness. Um, the uh, just to try to get at uh, really connecting with students ahead of time and we've seen uh, unfortunately in this and other committees uh, what happens when students uh, don't know what's hap what uh, the dangers are and unfortunately uh, find out too late. Uh, so it's a fairly simple straightforward bill with that I would ask for the committee's support and uh, send it on to higher education. Or excuse me, uh, I guess it's Ed Finance. Education Finance, that's right. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on House File 3062? Seeing none, are there any questions from members for Representative Dean? Representative Moran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so Representative Dean, I uh, think this is a very good bill and quite impressed that we are moving upstream and know that when we invest in education and awareness and other initiatives that um, support, you know, being ahead of the process, we can stop bad things from happening. So um, I am in fully support of this. And thank you for bringing it. Thank you, thank Representative, you Representative Moran. Moran. Are there any other questions or comments for Representative Dean? Uh, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Dean, for bringing this great bill forward. I, I've been uh, busy over the summer traveling around to a lot of communities talking about the bill that we will be hearing shortly. Um, and I love this bill. The question I have for you, Mr. Chair, would be um, I learned yesterday from a national speaker that uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders are where we need to start focusing in on this conversation with education. I thought I was doing a, a lot of good stuff in, in Sauk Center here about a month ago. I had seven through 12th graders there, and I thought we were getting to the right age. My question to you, Mr. Chair, if I could, is, is would you be open to looking at younger kids if we find that that's where it should be focused? Um, I'm sensing that sometimes I'm hearing ninth and 12th graders, it almost is getting too late to have them understand the power of this kind of addiction and the way it's coming at us. Uh, just asking for a little clarity if that's something that you might consider as it moves forward. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Baker. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, unfortunate news to hear, obviously. want to get at uh, the kids where they need to hear it, when they need to hear it, and would be definitely open to amending it uh, or trying to uh, make it better. Thank so. you so much. 
Any other questions about House File 3062? Seeing none, final word, Representative Dean. Uh, thank you for the committee time. Appreciate your support. With that, Representative Dean renews his motion that House File 3062 as amended be referred to the Committee on Education Finance. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion prevails, and House File 3062 as amended is referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Thank you, Representative Dean. Up next, we have Representative Zerwas with House File 2746. I will move that House File 2746 be re-referred to the General Register. Representative Zerwas, welcome to the committee. We have the bill in front of us. When you are ready, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. House File 2746 is follow-up on a bill that was passed last year around advanced practice nurses. One component uh, within the um, advanced practice nurse bill that was passed last year and signed into law um, added um, advanced practice nurses and physician assistants uh, to the list of providers that may authorize a new pair of prescription eyeglasses um, in the case of an emergency uh, situation. Um, everything within the APRN uh, bill last year was non-controversial, at least that was certainly the author's intent. Uh, after the bill had been passed by the House and Senate and signed into law by the governor, uh, the optometrist approached us and expressed some concern with this provision. And so uh, in trying to keep my word about having a bill uh, last year that was going to be non-controversial, I told them I would advance a bill to undo that portion of law that we passed last year. So that's the bill, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Zerwas. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on House File 2746? Welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Tom Lehman. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Academy of Physician Assistants. Uh, just by way of background, physician assistants practice medicine. We have four schools currently in the state uh, training physician assistants. A fifth is about to come online, hopefully next year at the Mayo uh, <coughs> Clinic. Their medical school is, is in the process of accrediting a physician assistant school. So we'll be graduating this year around 130 physician assistants that practice medicine all the way from primary care, family medicine, to oncology, <coughs> orthopedic, psychiatry, other, other areas. Um, and they provide um, greatly needed uh, uh, access to care in a lot of areas because of physician shortages. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman. I just want to mention that uh, physician assistants don't support this. Well, we've been in touch with Representative Zerwas, and we're going to continue conversations um, as it goes to the floor. But just wanted to know if there's concern on the part of the PAs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lehman. Are there any questions for the testifier? Representative Moran. Thank you. Representative Zerwas, can you confirm whether or not optometrists are supporting this? Representative Zerwas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, Representative Moran, uh, yes, uh, uh, the optometrists are the ones that approached me and asked me uh, to carry the bill after they objected uh, to the bill that was signed into law, a portion of the bill that was signed into law last spring. Representative Moran. Are there, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Zerwas, I don't know if you have other, if other people are going to testify, but I just would like to understand what the objection is to having the APRNs and the physician assistants do this. Uh, yeah, but I think Shep Harris with the optometrist is here and he can provide uh, their concerns. My, my intent, as I mentioned when I did the intro, my intent in the bill, uh, the APRN bill that we passed last year was to prov uh, work on provisions that all stakeholders had agreed to. Um, we moved that bill uh, without any controversy uh, through this committee, uh, through the House, through the Senate, and signed by Governor Dayton. It was only after that point that the optometrist uh, contacted me with concerns. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, my name is Chef Harris. I'm representing the uh, Minnesota Optometrics Association, and I, I want to thank Representative Zer Zerwas for bringing this forward. And to answer your questions, uh, Representative Liebling and Representative Moran, uh, yes, the optometrists are very supportive of this legislation, and this was, um, <coughs> I think, a case of where we were unfortunately not able to catch it in time. Actually, to your credit, 
Uh, the House did catch it in time, and uh, there was a floor amendment that was adopted that deleted this exact provision. Uh, it was the other body, which I know will remain nameless over here, uh, which uh, pushed to uh, to keep this in conference committee. And um, and Mr. Chair and members, just so you know and you're aware, and my apologies to Mr. Lehman, um, it's ironic we actually live in the same city. You think we'd be talking on this issue, but uh, but we hadn't. Uh, we had been working with uh, Ms. O'Connell from the uh, RNs, and uh, thought that uh, she was also representing the PAs as well, and the ophthalmologists were also involved in this. And that's where the physician-physician assistant issue is more of an issue with the, uh, the Minnesota Academy of Ophthalmologists. Practically, Mr. Chair and, and members, uh, this is emergency eyeglasses. This, uh, I call this the, the Syngem provision. This is where Senator Syngem, uh, a number of years ago, end of session, was in a rush, couldn't find his glasses, went to a local uh, store uh, to get his emergency replacement, and the optician incorrectly said, well, it's against the law. I can't give you, even though your prescription is valid, uh, I, can't give you, uh, you know, I can't give you an emergency replacement. So what we did was basically put into law what is common practice among optometrists and opticians and some ophthalmologists. And in uh, you know, practical and realistic situations, if you walk into a store trying to get an emergency pair of glasses, you're not going to have a physician, you're not going to have an ophthalmologist, you're not going to have a physician assistant or even a registered nurse there servicing you at the counter. You're going to have an optician, you're going to have a technician who is working with you, or an optometrist. So we feel like this is just cleaning up some language that um, <laughs> trying to help the other body see, uh, see the way that the House agreed to this last year. So I hope that answers your, your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Heavy lift indeed. Rep Mr. Harris, are there any questions for the testifier? Mr. Chair. Senator. Representative Sir. If I could just briefly, uh, Mr. Harris, uh, in his synopsis, did uh, refresh my memory in that uh, for the floor vote uh, on the APRN bill last year, we did have uh, a floor amendment that, that changed this, that passed out of the House. Um, and it was the Senate that uh, did not adopt that floor amendment. And then if I remember correctly, we concurred with the Senate language when it came back. I don't believe it went to a conference committee. And I think that was um, more with time left in session um, rather than a, a big policy objection. Thank you, Representative Zerwas, are there any other questions? Representative Lee Lane. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I mean, it's, this is probably not the issue of the century. Let's acknowledge that, you know. But I'm still a little bit confused about why we would take these folks out. I just, and it, you know, and I, even though Mr. Lehman came to the table, I'm still a little unclear. I mean, are the PAs okay with taking, being taken out? And, and Representative Zerwas, are the APRNs okay with being <coughs> taken out of this? I mean. Uh, Representative Zerwas. Mr. Chair and members, Representative Liebling, the uh, the APRN coalition uh, is okay with this change. Uh, Mr. Lehman contacted me last evening uh, to voice the objection from the physician assistants. Okay. Um, and I, my commitment to him was that I would continue to work with him on this and if necessary offer a, a, a floor amendment. Um, but we'll see how this moves forward in the Senate. Representative Liebling. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Zerwas. I mean, um, you know, um, to Mr. Harris's point, I mean, I just, if, if this isn't the way it happens, I don't know why we have the bill anyway. I mean, I don't really see the point of taking out these two classes of practitioners if, in, if as a practical matter, they aren't doing this anyway, and why we would leave physicians in there if, as a practical matter, this isn't the way it's happening. But, you know, what do I know? So... That's I guess there's, right. there's some reasons for this, I guess. <laughs> Representative Liebling, did you want Mr. Harris to respond no. with what you know? Oh, I know you have a busy schedule, Mr. Chair. I'll move on. All right. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House File 2746? Seeing none, are there any final questions from members? Seeing none, final word, Representative Zerwas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the committee's time. With that, I'll renew my motion that House File 2746 be re referred to the General Register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. No. The motion prevails, and House File 2746 is re referred to the General Register. Thank you, Representative Zerwas. Up next, we have Representative Frankie, and we'll be discussing House File 3019. 
And our intent is to have just an informational hearing on this today, and so we have no motion to make on this. Representative Frankie, House File 3019, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, this is House File 3019, um, opioid prescribing quantity limits. Uh, quick overview, uh, the bill sets a seven-day quantity limit for opioid and narcotic prescriptions, the treatment of acute pain associated with major trauma, surgical procedure, and the bill allows practitioners using clinical judgment to exceed this prescription. Um, basically, this is one of the, the uh, recommendations that came out of the prescribing task force. The, there's been, by the end of 2016, seven states had passed legislation limiting opioid prescriptions. The trend is continuing into 2017. As of, I believe, August of 2017, 30 other states are considering or have passed similar legislation. Mm -hmm. This legislation is, in my view, is very benign from what I feel we should be doing to combat this um, tragic situation going on in our state. Uh, since this is an only an informational hearing, I do have an amendment here that we will not move, but just for the committee's understanding that inserts the word initial. So this is going after the first time users, the first time prescribing contact with the doctor, with the patient. Um, we have left uh, outs for the doctors to use their own judgment. We do not want to necessarily go after the doctors, but we do want to change the mindset. Um, for so long, opioids have been a go-to in treating pain, and we need to change those ideas within our society. Uh, many of the laws stipulate that um, there must be exceptions and documentation in their records. We did not ask for this in this bill. Uh, I also, sh you should have some information from the NCLS on what's being done in other states. And you can see there that there's all different varieties. Some are tougher, some are not as tough compared to what we're asking for. So I provided you with that information so you can go through that at your leisure. I also did receive some questions on what the actual drugs are, Schedule 2 through 5 on opioids, and I brought that with me today and passing that out so everybody has an idea on what actual um, types of opioids we are looking at. And I understand I am the warm-up act to why we're really here and um, what we're really going to get to, so I will just stand for questions. All right. Is there anyone who wishes to testify on House File 3019? none other questions from members representative Dean thank you mr. chair and thank you representative Frankie for being, bringing this bill forward and also for the good uh, background information on what other states are doing and particularly the different schedules uh, which uh, I think is is important for people uh, on prescribing and one of the things that we're looking at in uh, from a policy standpoint of limitation on numbers of pills one of the things that we all hear about is the anecdotal uh, reports of people who go in for minor surgery or dental work or uh, ENT and you come home with a big jug of uh, opioids that sit in the cupboard or uh, remain around for a long time that the number of pills exceeds what you're needing and that creates the supply uh, that could be used uh, by other people in the house. Uh, so that is something that a lot of the specialties are trying to look at, trying to figure out how to limit the number of supplies uh, for the number of pills. So one of the things that I have heard and hear back from the different st um, doctor groups or prescribers is they're going to limit the number to either a number of days or a number of pills. Um, that kind of makes sense. Uh, the kind of the concerns that I have is um, I think about our friend Dean Erdahl and you know his knee knee replacement surgery and was in, that's a great deal of pain. Long time recovery recovers a lot of uh, a lot of 
um, pain medication uh, as opposed to a minor surgery or if somebody were to have abdominal surgery where they have to cut through uh, you know a lot of you to get inside the long recovery a lot of pain requires more uh, pain medication so the differences between minor surgery and major surgery of just kind of how you know we as legislators don't know that and can't figure that out ahead of time so that's like column A and then column B is how often do I have to drive back to the doctor and if you think about Dean Erdahl have, can't drive uh, has to load himself back into a car and then how far does he have to drive uh, you know if he has to drive three towns away or further away uh, so those are the two kind of considerations that I think a lot of the physician groups are wrestling with number of pills versus number of days how do you do that and then surgeries you know minor versus major and then travel distance so have you heard from folks uh, you know as you bounce this off of people have you heard from the you know MMA or from other groups about those are other concerns about how they're wrestling around with this representative Frankie thank you mr. <laughs> chair representative Dean um, yes we have and matter of fact I did also hear from chair Erdahl <laughs> <laughs> when I spoke with him on this bill and he brought up those same concerns uh, and we have left some stipulations in here for such um, instances uh, if you go to um, where you have acute pain does not include chronic pain um, so we put a stipulation in for the chronic pain to give the doctors and out there or people who are being treated for cancer palliative care hospice or end-of-life care also this would by inserting the word initial into this it does give the doctors that professional judgment in um, starting after line 1.19 so we are just attacking that initial contact with a person who does not have a reason to have ongoing care so I think we've addressed some of those MMA I think is right around neutral they'd like to discuss a little bit more on this I think that's why we're only informational right now but I don't think they're opposed um, this is something we need to do this is more of a guideline versus a mandate so um, back to what I've said this this bill is pretty milk toast compared to where um, to quote my friend Dave Baker at, <laughs> compared to what we should be doing representative Dean Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Frankie, for uh, taking us on and taking your subcommittee on, and uh, wish you all the best with that, and I know the committee members will want to be helpful with you uh, on this bill and on that subcommittee, so uh, all the best. Thank, thank you, Representative. you, Representative Dean. Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Frankie, so that this bill allow a physician to limit the prescription to seven days but if they feel a need they can extend it for more days correct okay. and so I'm a little confused here because representative Baker you just brought a bill to this committee that limited to five days right you wanted to have a limit on five days for opiate prescriptions on the refills so that on the sidebar can I get representative Baker to how do your bill differ from, differ from this bill Representative Baker. Mr. Chair and Representative Moran, I think, are you th thinking about last year's bill that I passed on the four day uh, no. limit for dentists? No, just, Moran. just, was it just last week you brought a bill about the limits on oh. opiates? Right, yes. Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think what you're referring to is the 30 day uh, expiration of a prescription for schedules three, four, and five. Didn't change the amount they could get. It wasn't a five day, it wasn't uh, limited to. Uh, anything more than the current 30 30 day script that would be filled so I nothing in my bill was about a five day anything okay. representative Moran so representative I don't know maybe Frankie or um, Baker do these are these in conflict any type of way no whether it's a 30 day prescription or a limit to a seven day prescription representative no? Frankie thank you mr. chair representative Moran no I believe Dave's bill was just about disposal correct Dave no. Senator Baker. No. <laughs> I was not I was not here for that hearing, so correct. And and to that point you were not here for that. And and no, there's no conflict at all. Um, um, 
what, what Representative Frankie is trying to do is to recognize the good work of the prescription work group, the providers that did this. It is a no conflict. We don't have anything else with uh, primary care doctors and, de and do doctors that would want to prescribe uh, the first initial seven day. Nothing else that I've ever worked with has had, had, had this conversation about a seven day script limit um, that I've seen. So this is not a conflict with anything that I know of. Representative Moran. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm just going to resonate on this a little bit. Um, but thank you. <laughs> Representative Frankie. Mr. Chair, we do have the Department of Pharmacy here that would like to clarify a little bit. Uh, welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I think I can maybe clarify this. I don't. I don't think I've uh, provided technical assistance for Representative Frankie, but I've looked at his bill and I did provide technical assistance last year to Representative Baker's bill and the one that he had this year. The, the distinction here is we have quantity limits <laughs> in this bill and the bill that Representative pa Baker uh, passed last year. That's a limit of literally the number of tablets or capsules that can be prescribed. Representative ba Baker's bill earlier or last week is a limit on the time during which a prescription can be filled. So if both passed, you could only have a certain quantity and then you would only have 30 days to get that prescription filled after which it would be void. So that's the distinction between the two bills. Thank you, Dr. Weiberg. And could you please state your name again for the record? I'm sorry, Cody Weiberg, Dr. Cody Weiberg, Executive Director of the Board of Pharmacy. All right, since we have you down here, Representative Moran, and any follow-up now? Thank you for the clarity. Are there any other questions for Dr. Weiberg as he's here? See none. Thank you, Dr. Weiberg. <laughs> Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Frankie, for bringing the bringing the bill. I, my only comment on this is I, I heard you say this is uh, milk toast. This is guidance versus a mandate. I just want to clarify the record on that. that. If this were to go through, this is statute. This is law. And remember, I mean, what we do down here, once it hits the law books, it takes a permanency and a life of its own. Um, I think there's some incredible medical groups out there that are probably providing guidance. So let's, I, I would just make sure we're very clear that we're not providing guidance. We're, we would provide law that is going to have intent, judicial consequences. There, there's just a lot more here. So um, I just am, am cautioning us to make sure we know all the information. I certainly have never sat on a medical board and I'm happy to, to have conversations, but we're not providing guidance. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Krishaw, for um, bringing that up to me. And I agree, what we do down here matters. And, and that's the point of being here and putting this bill forward. Um, I think we're probably a, a little late to the game here at the legislature. We see out there that there are already companies, um, doctor groups, and um, other entities that are already on their own instituting certain parameters of these prescribing limits um, because they see the need that we have. Um, they see the, the devastation that's going on. Um, my hope and I hope that all of our hope is to kind of just set a guideline for everyone across the state so that everybody's on the same page. So I agree with you. Thank you. Representative Krisha. Representative Liebling. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, uh, Representative Frankie, and um, appreciate that Representative Dean made those comments because um, about the balance to be struck here. And I'm glad we're having an informational hearing on this because I think it really is, um, it, it's a difficult kind of an issue because we all want to do what we can to stop this tremendous scourge of opioid abuse. There is no question about that. But we want to make sure uh, that we you know, to use the old phrase, first do no harm, right? And so, um, but I, I wanted to see, since this is an informational hearing, it's uh, curious to me that the MMA isn't testifying, and I, I wonder if, um, if they would care to kind of, uh, to come down, somebody from the MMA, and give us their perspective on this, because since it is an informational hearing, I think we should get some information. Um, See, Mr. Renard, I don't know if he wants to. Maybe he was trying to avoid. Seemed a little hesitant. Table, but did not stand up until you said his name, Representative. <laughs> yeah, and, 
And in the meantime, while he's coming down, let me just say too that since this is an information hearing and we're talking about <coughs> opioids, I just saw a report come out from the Department of Health that um, people who are using medical cannabis are reducing their rate of opioid use. And the use of cannabis is in states that have legalized cannabis or that where it's pretty freely available. We're talking about chronic pain patients. Um, that the use of cannabis is reducing opioid use and uh, possibly abuse and death. So that's something that we should all be thinking about as well. But I would just like to hear Mr. Renner's, um, you know, any information he would care to give us on the pros and cons of something like this, doing something like this. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Renner. If you could please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Dave Renner with the Minnesota Medical Association. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. We have met with uh, Representative Frankie and, and others, and we really appreciate the, the discussions we've had. Like all of you, we're all trying to figure out what do we do about the crisis that we have with opioids. Um, clearly, physicians have a role to play in this, and we have been working at the Medical Association to try to change the culture of prescribing, um, trying to address issues like how long of a, a dosage do you give for certain types of conditions. Um, what the bill before you, we, when we've, we've shared this with Representative Frankie, it clearly is something I would caution when the legislature starts putting into standards of what, how to treat a condition. Mm -hmm. And that is a concern that we have raised, regardless whether it's opioids, whether it's any other kind of condition. Uh, we would argue that that's not really the role of the legislature. We should leave that to the Board of Medical Practice and, and other professional groups. Um, to Representative credit, to Frankie's credit, what he has put forward, and I think this is a discussion you were having before, is short of a standard because it does have the, the paragraph that says um, if in your clinical judgment you think more is needed, you can provide more. Um, that would probably result and you'd have to make sure you doc document that in the medical record and what the reasons are, those types of things. So what you have before you is, in a sense, the guidelines that have been developed by ICSI, by the Department of Human Services, CDC, and others. Again, there is a balance and you all have raised that. It's, is it appropriate? Should you be putting it into law? It still makes many of our members a little nervous, but I think you've at least uh, tried to make it less of a standard, more of a guideline, and that's what Representative Frankie said. We are not as concerned as if it were a true standard, but, but, but I think you are having the debate of, of, of how you have that balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Renner. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Renner. And I um, know that something that pops out at me specifically from the bill language is that this language, um, Acute pain means pain that the practitioner reasonably expects to last only a short period of time, and yet you've got a very specific limit in here, the seven-day supply. Of course, you can exceed that just, um, I don't know if this is so much for Mr. Renner, but it seems there's a little mismatch in the language there. So um, that would be something maybe to consider going forward. But um, anyway, I uh, thank you for coming down, Mr. Renner. Are there any other questions for Mr. Renner? <coughs> Seeing none, the committee thanks you for your Thank testimony. You, you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House File 3019? <coughs> Seeing none, are there any final questions for Representative Frankie? Seeing none, final word, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee, for your time. We will continue to move this forward, continue to work on it with our stakeholders, um, try and get the language right, but we'll definitely be fostering this forward in the process. All right. Thank you, Representative Frankie, for coming in this morning. Uh, finally, today we have House File 1440. Representative Baker, make your way down. Representative Baker is moving to move the uh, bill to have it before us. Uh, Representative Baker, you have a DE2 <coughs> amendment that you wanted to uh, discuss from today. Is that correct? Uh, is it the DE3-2? Is that the DE3-2? Yes, my that apologies. That is correct, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move that as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative Baker to the DE-3-2. DE <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I just wanted to uh, say how grateful I am this morning to finally get my opioid stewardship bill in a revised manner to our committee. I think this starts an important conversation that the state of Minnesota needs to have about all options on the table to talk about how we get our arms around 
such an epidemic that has uh, killed so many of our citizens around the country. Um, the opioid crisis started back in the mid-90s when a company gave really bad research to the FDA. They're putting more powerful pharmaceutical heroin in a time-release pill, and they were calling it this non-addictive pill that would be less than 1% addictive. They overmarketed this product to our most trusted industry, which are our providers, and helped create a demand of these pills like we've never seen before. That demand has now killed thousands of Minnesotans. My bill is bold, and it takes guts for me to carry this bill to this committee. It's an idea to fund other ways than using 100% of the taxpayer dollars in our communities and families to try to get people through this horrible addiction. So what we're doing with this bill is we're asking the opioid manufacturers to come to the table. A penny a pill plus a modifier will raise about 15 to 20 million dollars for ongoing support and it goes right into recovery, education, child care services, and on and on. Our needs are endless and I felt that this idea of this bill was worth the conversation um, in a way that a lot of states haven't had yet. There's about eight other states in the country that are having this conversation. There have been three bills drafted federally that has the same type of a, a format. And I say it's time for Minnesota to start talking about this openly and start looking at other ideas instead of um, being afraid to talk about a stewardship fee. We have a number of testifiers today, members, so I want to start out by just saying again, I appreciate your time on this. I'm looking forward to listening and learning and hearing your thoughts and ideas. I know this is going to be a challenging bill, and I know I'm going to have to change things as it moves through the process. I'm willing to do that, but I want to ask for your support. I know this is an important issue to everybody. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I, I do want to just say a couple comments about my first testifier who will introduce himself, uh, Mr. Joe Ranasizi, who is next to me. Uh, is a uh, former DEA uh, diversion director yeah. that has helped our country enormously with trying to get his arms around and his department's arms around uh, the massive amount of <laughs> pharmaceutical pills that were going to communities that had no business getting those kind of pills. He has been a champion to our country to try to get his, his department, his agency to have some teeth and he's here to tell, I think, a very compelling story. When he heard of our bill here in Minnesota, it got his attention. And I'm just grateful to have uh, my ability to sit next to Joe Ranasizi today, Mr. Chair. Welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Joseph Ranasizi. I'm retired from the Drug Enforcement Administration after serving 29 plus years as a special agent diversion investigator. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee uh, for the opportunity to come forward and testify today. Uh, I want to thank Representative Baker for being so innovative in, in pushing forward this bill. I, I just want to say, this, this, first of all, this is the first state I've ever testified in, in the legislature. I, I've testified among, uh, in front of Congress on 33 occasions, 32, 33 occasions, but never in a state. So this is, this is new to me. But I could tell you that it's an honor to be here. 29 years of law enforcement, and I've never seen an epidemic like this. I, I was through crack, early days of heroin, club drugs, synthetic drugs, and, and, and the opioid epidemic by far is the most damaging and the most tragic drug epidemic we have. And it's not getting any better. It's not getting any better. When I was in, in the Office of Diversion Control, my job was not only to enforce the drug laws, but it was also try and think of new and innovative ways. And my, my thought process was going after the demand and trying to stop the hemorrhaging. And what I n neglected or failed to realize was the amount of resources that the states were expending to try and fix this problem. My job was never to look at resources. My job was trying to figure out how to stop the action. And, and when I read this bill, it, it, just, it just struck me as being so important because it's stopping a different type of hemorrhaging. The states can't keep 
bearing the burden of this tragedy while the drug companies are making billions of dollars. And, and it's got to stop. The only way it's going to be stopping is if people are held accountable. And that's the only way it's going to stop. <clears throat> so I applaud, I applaud Representative Baker, the members of this committee, and I hope, and I hope that you move this bill forward and, and start holding people accountable. Stewardship is a great, great idea that needs to be implemented. Um, I'd just like a brief PowerPoint to show you how we got to where we are. And if we could begin. I'm sure the technology is this difficult at the congressional level too, Mr. Renzi. <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't, I don't think I've ever used a computer in, in, in Congress. Light years ahead of you. <laughs> Light years ahead of Congress. <laughs> and you seem a lot more agreeable to each other. <laughs> 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 well, while we're waiting, let me begin. Uh, Representative Baker was absolutely correct. When, when this problem started because information was passed, and information went out into the domain of the medical community about opioids that we had never, ever heard before. Information like, well, you know what, they're not as dangerous as we thought they were. And, and don't worry about it because unless your family has an addiction history, you're, the chances of getting addicted to these drugs are, are slim. And, and my favorite, well, if the drugs are in a sustained release formula, that, that'll minimize the attempts or the, the chances of addiction. And that's what we heard over and over again. Now, we always had a pharmaceutical abuse problem. We always had a pharmaceutical abuse problem, but never to the extent that we had after we started seeing prescribers prescribe outside of palliative care, hospice care, end of life, and cancer pain. Now they were prescribing for chronic pain. Now they were prescribing in large quantities for just acute pain. And what we saw, and I, I don't remember which representative uh, asked, asked the question, but yes, it was anecdotal information, but we saw it all the time. Dennis prescribing 30 or 40 hydrocodone pills for a tooth extraction, okay, or for dental pain. Doctors who were prescribing high schoolers uh, who had muscle strains, hydrocodone. Hydrocodone became the drug of choice. And in fact, hydrocodone was, up until 2014, the number one prescribed drug in the United States of all drugs. Hydrocodone was number one. A painkiller was number one. Okay. And with that, we started seeing overdose deaths. Overdose deaths started to skyrocket. And, and we started seeing the United States consumption levels go up. The United States is the number one consumer, the number one consumer of hydrocodone, oxycodone, hydromorphone, fentanyl, morphine, and, and hydromorphone. Those six drugs, we're the number one consumer in the world of. And in some cases, like oxycodone, we consume 70% of the world's oxycodone. Now, we only have 5% of the world's population. So the question is, why? It, it, do we just know something that the world doesn't know? The answer is because our doctors and our medical community was trained to prescribe these drugs. And it was based on anecdotal information and information that wasn't scientific. And that's where we are today. So if we're sitting here and, and and we're bearing the burden of this tragedy. And all these people, 
All of our loved ones are passing. Okay. Why is it that companies continue to make billions of dollars off that and not be held accountable for it? Look, I was frustrated because I sat in my office every night trying to figure out how to stop this while a ton of people were making a lot of money and it's got to end. It needs to end now. This is a bill that will end that, or at least hold accountability. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Renzizi. Are there questions for the testifier? I have a statement. Uh, Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say once again that, um, you know, often we talk about going upstream and um, doing preventive measures. And often enough, we don't invest in those type of initiatives in this body. But I'm happy to see that we are seeing some value in going upstream um, and doing some accountability also. But also saying to folks, you know, if we can educate people and bring some awareness that we can prevent bad things from happening. And so this bill helps to do that. So I just want to say thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Representative Moran. Are there any other questions or comments for the testifier? Seeing none, Mr. Ranzizi, the committee thanks you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. Representative Baker, who's next? Uh, All right, welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dr. Chris Johnson. And uh, I'm here to uh, speak in support of this uh, stewardship bill. And um, my tech is more appropriate, I think, for this. Uh, I wrote it down on a yellow sheet. Um, this bill is about industry accountability. And I want to uh, second some of the things that uh, my colleague Joe has said from, from the DEA. Because make no mistake about this, the industry caused this. The industry, the healing profession caused this. And you are going to hear a number of, the industry is fairly complex. I mean, you have providers, you have pharmaceutical companies, you have insurers, you have um, governmental institutions like the Center for Medicare Services, and they can all sort of point fingers at each other. Well, what about you guys? And, well, we didn't write the prescription, and, well, we, we didn't. You know. And that's true, but you know what? When it comes down to, you know who didn't cause this? The patient. This was not due to some grassroots movement that patients suddenly got together in the late 1990s and said, we demand more of this. All the patient knows that they have pain. And they came to the medical, they came to their provider, they came to the industry and said, I'm hurting. They trusted us that, that the treatment they were going to get was scientifically vetted and was proven safe and effective in appropriate, powered, scientific, perspective, long-term studies. They had no idea that that was never done. And actually, we know even more, more now than we did even before that was never done, because in 2014, the NIH looked for the best studies on opioids for chronic pain, and none lasted longer than three months. None. Most were six weeks. You barely even made the definition of chronic pain at that point. Um, and so we need to start, and so you ask, how did this happen? And this happened because um, the pharmaceutical industry had a lot to do with this campaign of advocacy saying these medicines were safe and effective. And they took advantage of an industry that's actually poorly equipped to do scientific vetting. There are over 400,000 studies published each and every year. Doctors can't possibly keep up with it. Such a deluge of information means we trust sort of our, our academic faculty, our industry leaders, our key opinion leaders at pain, at uh, institutions, uh, uh, you know, academic institutions. Um, and the pharmaceutical co uh, companies um, co-opted some of these physician leaders to spread the message that these medicines were safe and effective when the data says actually that wasn't true. <coughs> and the, so this bill is going to start holding these, um, uh, you know, if not, ex ex uh, if not disingen completely disingenuous, they were at least misleading in the kind of anecdotal bits of data that they presented to us as providers. And we, and we trusted that information. Um, I won't say that pharma is entirely responsible because they can say that, yes, we, well, we didn't write the prescriptions. 
And what is also true is that pharmaceutical companies um, sell their drugs all over the world, but this really only happened here. So this was a systemic failure, a systemic failure of everyone in, in, in the industry. And so I would say that this bill, the stewardship bill that holds, starts to hold pharma accountable should be the beginning, not the end, of a reckoning of a system that has completely failed the American population. We charge extortionary prices, and yet mortality in this country is getting worse. And it's driven largely by opioid prescribing and overdose and death. That should not be acceptable to anyone in this room. It should not be acceptable to the medical profession. It should not be acceptable to our, our, our uh, legislators and our leaders. Uh, it is time that that process gets reevaluated and changed because for, for sure what I know um, is the patients deserve better. So thank you very much. Are there any questions for me? All right, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Are there any questions for the testifier? Seeing none, the committee thanks you, Dr. Johnson, for your testimony this morning. Representative Baker, who do we have next? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have uh, Shelley Elkington from the Steve Rumler Foundation. Ms. Elkington, welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and then present your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having me. My name is Shelley Elkington. I am a board member of the Steve Rumler Hope Network, and I'm also a mom. Um, I am here to tell you the story about all the things you're hearing that can happen, I am here to tell you that it does happen. Uh, last night, we watched a slide presentation by Mr. Ranasizi that uh, laid out exactly what happened to my daughter, Casey. Prescribed, tolerance, need more, get cut off, turn to heroin, die. Happens all over this country, 60,000 times, in fact, last year. In fact, it happened in my community just four days ago. I'm from Montevideo. Less, of, less than 5,000 people live there. We have overdose deaths in our community. So this is a rural Minnesota problem. It's a metro problem. But my daughter was 19 years old. She was attending NDSU in Fargo. She was studying radiology. She was a bright student, uh, talented. She was a champion swimmer. She been to the state swim meet a couple times. She was a dancer. She was ready to move on with her life. In the second semester, she was diagnosed with uh, Crohn's disease. And if you don't know what that is, it's an autoimmune disease that affects the digestive tract. Um, it can be very painful, and it was for her. She ended up having to leave school. She returned home, and she worked while trying to manage her disease. She eventually moved to Alexandria. She loved Alexandria. <laughs> it was her favorite place. It was a, per it was a perfect community for her and wonderful health care. She was going to study nursing there and started school there at the college. Her disease, though, started to get much worse during this time, and she was prescribed pain medications to help manage it. And this is where it started to be where she was getting pain medication to treat symptoms, not her disease. So her disease is getting worse, all the while she's taking these medications to help make her feel better. For several months, she was taking a very powerful painkiller called Dilaudid. It was the very first pain med she ever took was Dilaudid. She was taking it several times a day, and as the months went on, her condition actually got worse, so she takes more of them. Um, eventually, her intestine narrowed to the size of a pen. So again, she's getting sicker, taking more medication, so she's not getting better. She ended up having surgery to remove several feet of her colon, but her recovery was made so difficult and nearly impossible because of this tolerance that she had built up to these medications. She could not find any pain relief after surgery. Could you imagine having feet of your intestines removed and not having any pain relief? She was miserable. She was a difficult patient. I was there. Um, <laughs> during a procedure, she was given enough anesthesia that a 300-pound man would have received. She weighed 87 pounds. She became septic. She was hospitalized for months. She had drains inserted into her swollen and now septic abdomen with no pain relief. She would beg for more drugs to help her, and she did not understand what was happening or why. She couldn't understand why the nurses wouldn't want to take care of her, why doctors refused to prescribe <laughs> such large doses of pain medications in the hospital. She hadn't done anything except take medications that were prescribed to her. How could this be happening? I listened to her scream in agony while she's having drains stuck into her belly and nurses screaming at her, telling her to stop. Imagine if that was your child. 
It was during this time it became very clear that these medications that she was taking had created this nightmare. She was eventually switched to oxycodone, oxycontin, because again, we thought the oxycontin was going to be better, and eventually fentanyl. She was also now, because her life is pretty well miserable, copious amounts of benzodiazepines, clonopin, and ativan. Life is not pleasant when you are now into a full-blown addiction. After two years of taking these medications, it was obvious that something needed to be done. She was petrified of telling her physician who she admired so much, she didn't want to let him down. Our family tried desperately to tell her that she needed help. It was impossible to try and convince her that the medications that were prescribed to her had caused her to be an addict. She wasn't unlike many of you, an addict. Isn't that somebody who drinks too much? Is an alcoholic? Does other illegal drugs? An addict isn't somebody that takes pain medications that are prescribed to them. One of the last words she said to me was, but mama, it's not my fault. And my answer to her was, no, it's not. Somebody said the words here today, first do no harm. And I want you to remember that as you listen to Casey's story. Her doctor did not intend to cause her harm. Her doctor did what he thought was right, but it did. So that's why we're here today. Casey ended up on social security disability when she was 24 years old. She was an athlete who was perfectly capable of going to school and being a professional in this state and giving back to others. And she is living now off the government at 24 years old. It was humiliating for her. Her dreams and hopes of being a nurse had faded. Casey turned to heroin when she struggled with the taper from her pain medications. She was with people that I never thought she would ever know in her life. She kept secrets from us. We had no idea where she was for up to two, three months at a time. We looked and searched to try to find a place for her to get well, but we often came up short finding any resources for her. She finally agreed to see a pain doctor that she had during her recovery at Abbott. She had an appointment with him on August 20th, 2015. I was called on August 19th, 2015 to tell me that her body had been found in her garage one day too late. They ask you a lot of questions when your child dies, don't they? Mm -hmm. They ask you to identify her body. They ask you what funeral home you want her to go to, if you want her buried or cremated, what clothes you want her in, what songs and scripture do you want played at her funeral. But I can assure you there is one question they do not ask you. They do not ask you if you're a Republican and they don't ask you if you're a Democrat. So I'm gonna ask you today to not be one either. I'm gonna ask you to be moms and dads and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and just humans today. I talked to her doctor several times after she died. She adored him. I can assure you that hearing of her death was one of the worst days of his professional life. His words to me were, quote, what was I supposed to do? I didn't know. I thought it would be safe, unquote. His life is now forever impacted as well. While they weren't safe, he was sold a bad bill of goods, just like many physicians across the country, by companies that were out to make money. Plain and simple, we can talk about what it is, but that's what it is. They have not offered solutions other than to shift blame so they can continue to do what they do. They've made threats and they want to convince you that this mess does not belong to them. But we know differently now, don't we? We know it does. If any other major company in this country created a natural disaster or an impact on a, our country, they would be expected to clean it up. The option of leaving a mess is not an option. We don't leave messes. It's time that we require pharmaceutical companies to clean up this mess for Casey, for Dan, 
for Ariel and Dylan and Luke and Steve, and I could name you. I could sit here and name off names for the next hour. So thank you for considering taking a vote on this bill. It does not restrict meds. It simply asks that the industry that made multi-billions of dollars and that have not taken any actions to help mitigate the process becomes a bit accountable. And uh, I thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Ms. Elkington, for your testimony today. While we can't uh, imagine what you've been going through, we can imagine it was very difficult to share that with us today. And so thank you for your willingness to provide your testimony today. Are there any questions for Ms. Elkington? Seeing none, the committee thanks you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Representative Baker, who do we have next? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Kenzel is next to join me. That's Kazel. Kenzel. Kazel. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the committee, Lieutenant Kazel. Please state your name once again for the record and present your testimony. Good morning. Um, I'm Lieutenant Jeff Kazel with the Duluth Police Department, and I'm also the commander of the Lake Superior Drug and Violent Crime Task Force. Uh, we're a task force that is one of 21 uh, VSET groups that's sponsored by the state. And my task force region includes St. Louis County, Carleton County, Lake County, and Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, that's, that's one testimony that's hard to, to follow. That's very emotional. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a perfect example of you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And I remember the, the, the commercial that was always out there in the 80s and 90s. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. And what that means is that you can go to this bill and support this bill to get the help that we need for the things that are out there that need to get done. Or you can turn your back and deal with the problem after. Because if you, if you deal with the problem after, you're going to be dealing with things that are going to be 20 times worse. And that's the truth. Uh, I think we can all agree on the gravity of the situation. But I, I wanted to, to give you some stories that we're seeing on, a, on the front line of, of battling this epidemic. Um, first story is uh, it's about a football player, a uh, 17-year-old kid that uh, got hurt playing football. Excuse me. And uh, he was prescribed pills. Um, I think it was oxyhydrocodone, excuse me. And uh, he uh, stayed on the prescription for a while. And then he, he wasn't getting the pills anymore. And that's when my task force met up with him. Two years later, he was in Duluth scoring heroin. And he ended up getting arrested with the dealer that we were monitoring. So this is a common story. I don't know if you realize the, the gravity that we're in. Common. Another story. We do many operations uh, uh, every week. We are set up in uh, the mall area in Duluth, and we observe you know, several drug transactions that were occurring. And we noticed uh, probably a 14, 15-year-old girl show up at one of these transactions. We, uh, we observed it. We followed her back to her car. And she was about ready to shoot heroin into her veins. The cheerleader, OK? Her boyfriend introduced her to pills three months earlier. And now she was to, to heroin. Final story. Uh, this is with one of my investigators, and this just happened two months ago. One of my investigators got hurt uh, and had neck surgery, um, and he was prescribed uh, painkillers. Pain um, he, he did well. He, he recovered great, but he, he kept the pills. He had a, uh, a dinner party with, with some friends. These are friends that he's known for 20 years, very good friends. Um, they, they, they were social and had, had a nice dinner uh, and then left. The following day, the, the, the female of the, 
the party that uh, was there showed up at his door and handed him a, his, a bottle of pills with um, five of them missing. And he came to my office and he said, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, that's, well, we, we ended up charging her and that might seem extreme, but that's the only way this person was getting any help. This person knew this guy was a, a, a task force officer, a, a drug cop, and she was willing to go into, into his uh, cabinet and steal his pills. That's where we're at. Uh, I represent a region uh, that has been disproportionately affected by this epidemic. If you look at the Minnesota Department of Health overdose statistics, uh, St. Louis County has been number one or number two in the opioid per capita death rate for the past six years. It's a big city problem <clears throat> and it's reached our community. We, we're, we're a mid-sized city with a mid-sized budget and mid-sized resources. We need help. When I entered this position in 2014, uh, I remember a discussion that I had with then uh, U.S. Attorney Andy Luger. Mr. Luger said, uh, don't let this problem get to the point that what it's like in states in Kentucky and Ohio. You need to be aggressive. I took that to heart. And we started looking outside of the box of, of going at this, and just not just with the law enforcement view. Instead of merely focusing on law enforcement, our task force area uh, went to reduce the demand by collaboration with our Opioids Abuse Response Strategies Group. Uh, with our partners, we introduced educating our community uh, through forums and then introducing DARE to our, our, our schools in Duluth again. We've supported the efforts of treatment for individuals that were suffering from this disease. And that's a way of pulling people out of the pool of addiction that we have in our area, a very large pool. And the, the tough thing is that uh, the people that we're arresting on a day-to-day -day basis that are coming to our community uh, to, to take advantage of our pool of addiction, they all know it. They're taking advantage of these people. All these programs are designed to reduce demand in our area, which is causing many of our problems we see in our communities. We knew as a department, you can't uh, treat someone if they're uh, dead. Um, with that, we introduced uh, Narcan in May of 2016 in the Duluth Police Department to all of our patrol officers. Uh, we received a, a hundred kits uh, for that original, um, uh, that for the original uh, play. Um, those kits are used or they've expired. Again, we need help. We've actually uh, done fundraising to our community to, to receive funds to continue this program. Um, uh, we've also received a commitment from the Rumler Foundation for 50 kits, which is great, and, and I'm very thankful for the Rumler Foundation. But I'll be honest with you, uh, I, I shouldn't have to fundraise for tools that are desperately needed. Uh, to help save people. The most recent uh, synthetic opioids to hit the streets are becoming more and more potent. Fentanyl, carfentanyl, and albromidol, which is supposed to be 12,000 times uh, more potent than morphine. Uh, this increase uh, in the potency, it, it scares law enforcement, okay? Granted, there is no uh, uh, scientific fact as, as far as exposure to fentanyl and uh, the different synthetic opioids, but we're, we're afraid. And many of us want, uh, want these kits to be with us. There's no reason why everybody, uh, every law enforcement officer in the state shouldn't have one. They've got a vest, they probably should have a kit. Our number of responses to overdoses are ever, uh, ever increasing with year to year. In my duties as commander of the task force, uh, I've been to all of the counties of the area of operation that I cover, and there are small to medium uh, agencies that have no Narcan, Narcan kits. Uh, 
We know from the cases we are submitting, the trend of the opioid epidemic is moving to more markets. These markets include rural areas and Native American reservations. So this is what it's all about. We need these. Our police need these. Our sheriffs need these. Our community needs these. Your constituents need these. I ask you for your support of the stewardship bill to give us what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Kazel, for your testimony today and all the uh, different types of examples you were able to cite for us and your experiences there. They are unfortunately plenty. Are there any questions for Lieutenant Kazel, Representative Olson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Lieutenant Kazel. I've had the opportunity to meet with Lieutenant Kazel and the ORS group, and I have to say that our region is, as you've heard, really impacted by this issue. But I am just, you know, heartened by what you've done in terms of coming together. I've sat in rooms and you have coalitions of partners across all of the sectors. You've done what you can. And I, I think the regional approach and we have done as much as we can without the adequate resources. And I hear you say we need help. And I hear you say we shouldn't have to fundraise to get Narcan in the hands of the people who need it. So as, as someone who we ask a lot of our communities and you have really risen to that occasion and I'm glad you're here to share that with us and ask for the help we need. So thank you for that. Thank you. And to Rep Baker, thank you. You're not just being bold, you're being brave. <laughs> and, um, and what you're moving in this bill will do a lot of what Lieutenant Kazel, he hit on a lot of topics, but this bill actually would address with the, with the amendment, would hit all of those pieces. And so I, I appreciate that we're bringing this forward in a way that we can do everything from treatment to Narcan funding. And I think this is a great bill. Thank you, Representative Olson. Are there any other questions for, or comments for the testifier? Representative Flanagan, <laughs> my apologies. It's okay, at least you didn't call me Peggy Fleming, Mr. Chair. That happens a lot, especially during ice skating season. Um, uh, uh, Lieutenant, thank you um, so much for um, your testimony and um, Representative Baker for bringing this bill forward. Uh, as you mentioned, when you talk about the area and the communities that are impacted, you talked about the native community. Yes. Um, I wanna just, um, lift that up, uh, our community, my community um, experiences um, the negative effects of opiates, I think more than uh, frankly anybody else in the state. And when um, we talk about uh, this bill in particular, and when we talk about um, the, the need to move um, urgently uh, on this issue, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, some of the ways that uh, you're doing work in partnership with the Native community and, and what you think the need is uh, for culturally relevant um, uh, treatment and support. Yes, uh, we uh, just Lieutenant recently, Kazel. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we just recently had a forum uh, with our uh, Fond du Lac Reservation uh, friends uh, in Duluth just, just last night. Um, and we answered a lot of questions. Uh, it's good, uh, a good collaboration of, of the group. Um, we have very good panelists that are able to talk about all the different uh, aspects of this problem from uh, law enforcement to treatment to uh, getting help for the families uh, like with Narna. Um, very helpful and, and, and we're, we're planning on having more of these and, and expand them to the different areas. Representative Flanagan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Baker, I just want to offer this up. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the, the news and the things that get covered around here are times when we don't agree with each other. Um, this is clearly a place where we can come together. Um, I know that your life was dramatically affected by this issue and there are people that I love in my own life who are affected by this issue and I just want to say thank you and uh, that I am your partner in figuring out how to move this forward. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Flanagan. Are there any other questions or comments for Lieutenant Kazel? Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your testimony, Lieutenant Kazel. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Here's a question. Okay. <laughs> we all try to get away when Representative. Right. 
Um, I don't have a response to that. <laughs> the, uh, you know, we have passed a number of laws here, and I think the most significant, ba based on my memory, and uh, Representative Baker can correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was a, uh, a connection between reimbursing doctors for, the, uh, for their ability to reduce pain in a, in a patient. So therefore, the more pain they reduced, they could actually get higher compensation, which to me incentivized this whole thing along with the promotion from the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, uh, based on the laws we have passed, have you seen some slowing in the problem at all? Or is it still growing at the exponential rate? Do you see the medical community putting some restraint on this? Uh, you know, is it, Growing at the at a exponential rate like you've seen before is that act, are we actually beginning to see some some uh, slowing or benefit from this? Uh, good good question. Um, the Minnesota medical community has been very responsive, and you have seen that the the prescriptions uh, that are going out have been reduced. But the issue is you have people that are in that pool of addiction. They're going to be looking to other other means and. You're seeing the synthetic fent fentanyls that are on the street, heroin, um, car fentanyl, those are on the increase, and, and so are the deaths. So um, you've, you've, got, uh, you've got a pool of people that, uh, that need to be taken out of that pool to <coughs> reduce the demand that we have in, in this community. Uh, we need to educate better to make sure that we're not allowing more people to get into that pool. Um, I was looking at a statistic uh, before we had this presentation today that um, if I said 175 to this committee, what would it mean to you? And that's, that's the number of people that are dying every day as a result of an opioid-related death. It's, it's increased. It's, it's going up. It's, it's gone from 91 to 114 to now 175. It's, it's going to come to a point where it, it's probably going to surpass alcohol deaths. Um, yeah, you, you, you need to make a decision on whether uh, we're going to be leaders here and lead the country and do the right thing because the price that we're going to pay uh, in the end if we do nothing is going to be, like I said, 20 times worse. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that response, Lieutenant. And thanks for your service as a uh, law enforcement officer, the, um, especially in this area. The, uh, I, in my own family, I had a, uh, a relatives who were addicted to prescription drugs and doctor shopped and alcoholism, and I'm, you know, I'm not immune from any of that as far as my family is concerned, too. So I understand the devastation it can have on uh, uh, families and also the death of a young person uh, through uh, overdosing. So if I hear your, your comments correctly, though, there are, you do see some positive action within the medical community, but we do have this pool of people that have been addicted. And I know addiction, uh, it creates uh, desperate people. And desperate people will do desperate things to get what they have to have. And, uh, you know, because you no longer can decide whether to use something, you have to do it. And you'll steal, rob, or do whatever you have to. So, um, that was my, uh, I guess what I was trying to get at is that do we see the institutions that we have uh, improving and the pool of people that are currently addicted, we need to continue to address and, and figure out ways to help them and get them off that addiction. I mean, uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. And I, I think you can show economically it's, it's the right thing to do too. Um, but the, this has already been brought up. The one, the one person that's not at this table right now is the pharmaceutical com uh, companies and distributors. Um, they've made billions and billions of dollars off these products. Uh, they deceived, deceived doctors, they deceived the public, and um, they're still making money off of it. Representative Grunhagen. You know, I did uh, jail ministry for 13 years, so I just want to make clear I wasn't in jail, but I used to, you know. <laughs> not that some people wouldn't like to see me locked up at times. But anyway, the, uh, you know, and one of the things I used to share with them was that, you know, it seems like uh, <clears throat> the selling of addiction has grown exponentially in our society in so many different areas, whether it's 
you know, uh, alcohol, uh, tobacco, drugs, uh, even music in some cases, and pornography. And that selling of addiction has just grown exponentially in the last 30, 40 years. And uh, I think in those areas, and it's a lot of it's been said to be protected by free speech. I don't think exploiting and addicting your fellow human being is, is uh, guaranteed under a constitution, personally. And uh, to the degree that we can start contesting this I, and helping, uh, especially our young people, understand that there's marketers of addiction out there um, who simply want to exploit them financially and could care less what happens to them physically, I think can uh, goes, go a long way to uh, helping our young people begin to be insulated from some of these influences. Thanks again for your service. Thank you, Thank you. Representative Grunhagen. Are there any other questions or comments for Lieutenant Kazel? Seeing none, <clears throat> Lieutenant Kazel, the committee thanks you for your testimony today. Representative Baker, do you have any other testifiers? Yeah, Mr. Chair, we're ready to wrap things up. I have uh, one more on my list, and that would be uh, Mr. Chad uh, Thad Jensen, please. Okay. Mr. Jensen, welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and present your testimony. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Thad Jensen, and I'll first off say I'm an addict and alcoholic. And I'm here today uh, in support of Representative Baker's uh, bill moving forward. Um, I come from a family of addiction. Um, my father, a pharmacist, uh, lost his license due to opiates. He's now in recovery, six years, moving on seven years. I myself, uh, two and a half years in right now, uh, towards sobriety. Uh, two and a half years ago, you wouldn't have recognized me. I wouldn't have known that I would have been here testifying today in front of you. Um, that comes to my son. My son had a hockey injury at 13, uh, was prescribed medication for the injury. And I'm here today because of his success. He was able to uh, fight through the addiction. Uh, Representative Dean asked for high school and college kids. Representative Baker came back and said, we need to educate younger. High school is too late for my son. Mm -hmm. He needed it younger. Fourth, fifth, and sixth grade is when that education needs to start. I am a proud proponent of that. Um, he today, at 15, is one year sober. I'm giving him a coin for one year of sobriety before I give him his keys. Now, what that comes down to is when I went through my program, my dad went through his program, and now my son goes through the program, the big word that came up today is accountability. And when we as addicts go in, we're asked to get honest, to get accountable for what our actions have done. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it and moved forward. And the reason I'm here in support of this today is because of that. There's accountability that is due out there. It's asked of us as addicts, and we're asking it now. We're asking them to step up to the plate and take their accountability in the matter. Now, these funds are something that are, is needed to move upstream and downstream. Uh, my son goes to Pease Academy. I'm sure any of you know what that is. It's been around since 1989 in Minnesota. It's the longest standing sober high school in the state of Minnesota and in the country. Now, P stands for Peers Enjoying a Sober Education. You talk about funds being needed. The prom is coming up for them, and we're having to fundraise to support the prom for roughly 50 or 60 kids to go. What public school system out there has to fundraise for their prom? But yet these kids that have made a decision to get honest with their lives and be accountable for what they've done are asking to do that. These funds are greatly needed to move downstream to help our youth, to educate them. Treatment is great. Recovery is what works. And recovery is lifelong. Now, myself, two and a half years into sobriety, 
Once my son went through addiction, I saw where I needed to go. And um, I switched from the education field, uh, getting my master's. I'm now a graduate student uh, at Hazleton Betty Ford. I'll graduate next year. I'll move into a chemical health and mental health counselor and therapist. I'm giving back and I'm wanting to help. But yet, in order to keep people like myself and other graduates, we also need to step up and provide funds to pay these people. As the epidemic increases and we get more and more people addicted, we also need more and more people to help them. And these funds will help with that. So today I'm going to close and thank my dear friend, Representative Baker, who by chance I got an opportunity to meet and spend an amazing evening with him last night and now today. And I hope that friendship continues on as we fight this battle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, for sharing your story with us today and providing some testimony. Are there questions for Mr. Jensen, Representative Halverson? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Jensen, could you um, uh, give us some information on um, what it takes and to um, go through treatment for opioid addiction? Um, what is the length of time um, that perhaps your son or you experienced in terms yeah. of addiction recovery and how long it takes? Mr. Jensen. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's all dependent. Recovery is unique. It's dependent on every person um, that comes in. And that comes down to the therapist and understanding at what point or where they're at in that recovery process. Uh, for myself, uh, it was a matter of peeling away uh, the chemical and the substance and then getting down to the mental health issue that was the real uh, culprit within it. And then once I was able to manage that. So for myself, it was a three month long uh, uh, in hospital treatment. Um, I have an amazing family. I have a wife of 17 years. My wife, when I came home, was able to take MNLA. And she took four months off to take care of me to get me to that next step. And that brings back that once these people, addicts and alcoholics, get out, the process doesn't stop. These people are transients. These people are homeless. They have no job skills. That's where this money needs to help, is to give them the next step, the next opportunity to move forward. So to answer your question, 30 days, I'm in the field right now, 30 days to six months, depending on the severity of it. Um, it's just a matter of, it comes down to also the willingness of, of the addict, the alcoholic themselves. How, how willing are they to make that decision? And for some, it's, it's a one and done for myself. I wasn't, uh, it took me a while to get through my th uh, thick skull. You know, being a hockey player, I guess it takes that. <laughs> Representative Halverson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that information, Mr. Jensen. I think that um, this testimony and the other testimony that we've heard, we are hearing how much this is costing our society in terms of lives, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, people being able to uh, be productive members of society, um, and also in terms of health care costs. Um, three months of inpatient treatment is incredibly costly. Um, it's uh, costly in our health care system. Those costs are passed along to others. I know that um, there are some folks who are concerned that if we level some type of a tax against the pharmaceutical companies um, in order to fund things like treatment, things like prevention, um, so that we don't have to pay for treatment, um, et cetera, that uh, somehow this is going to um, cost a lot of money for patients in the system. If that becomes reality, for shame on the pharmaceutical companies. Um, the fact is, is this is having an incredible impact on our society, on families. Um, people shouldn't be losing their children. People shouldn't be sending their middle schoolers to, to three months of inpatient treatment because of prescribed drugs. Um, and so if the pharmaceutical companies plan to pass this cost along to patients, 
for shame. And I think that that um, it is also incumbent upon us to call for more transparency with the way these companies are doing business in Minnesota. Um, because if they're passing this uh, cost along, a penny, a pill, that's nothing in their world. But it's everything in the life of a family who is trying to save their child. Mm -hmm. um, and so thanks for the information and the testimony. And, and uh, we're here to help work with you and, and Representative Baker. Thank you, Representative thank Halverson. You. Representative Kresha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the testifier, and thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, so as I work through, the, and I, I, I think through this, I'm going to set aside the, the surcharge. I'm going to set aside whatever you want to. Uh, we, we need some services. We need some resources. Um, you have some, uh, if we get the funding, however we get to that, there is at least 30% set aside for what I consider to be at the root of this uh, systemic issue to find a solution that's child protection. And my question to you, to the testifier, not necessarily on your case, and I'm looking for some, some overall, if you, uh, if you could wind yourself back to the, to the point where before you, uh, someone, and again, I, I, I'm not looking for yours, however you want to do this, but at some point, somebody becomes addicted, chronic addiction kicks in. Where do we start to solve that issue? I mean, what barriers could have been put in place for an addict before they even got to that? Does this go back to the, the trauma and the aces of that child? I've read so many studies that say we're dealing with what happens in the first five years of their life that's manifesting itself finally in a chemical dependency. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to know is, I mean, we can, we can attack this here, but what I really want to know is I'm more worried about those zero to five-year-olds right now that are about to be addicts in junior high, high school, and, and so that, that's what I really want to know. I mean, we, we can push this forward, but I, I really want to know how we're getting to the generation now that the person who's going to be sitting in my seat in 10 years is dealing with. And I don't know if you have an answer for that. I know that's a lot. Mr. Jensen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's a great question, and it goes back to you need to stop the cycle. How do we stop the cycle? That's where I came in with my family, stopping the cycle. My son now will not need to see his kids or have him be seen as an addict in full blown. We need to get to the root of it. We need to get down to the grass roots of where this addiction starts. We need to start creating positive, honest values as these kids are coming through so that when these issues do arise, we open the communication. We're no longer, uh, as an addict and alcoholic, embarrassed to say that. We need to support one another. We need to find positive uh, peer role models for these individuals when situations arise for them and not uh, outcast them. Outcasting in that I live in a northern suburb, Elk River. My son gets on the train at 6.30 in the morning, rides to Target Field, where he catches another bus over to the East Bank to go to school. That's what he wants. He wants sobriety, but how do we help him? How do we help these kids get to that level? We need to start early so that it doesn't come to that. We need to look at family values, where they come from, and, and instill these when kids are young and when they're coming up. Representative Kresha. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Baker and to Mr. Jensen. Your story is my story. Um, about two years ago, I was sitting in the ER with my brother just praying that a detox center would have an open bed. Um, you know, we're lucky. Mm -hmm. My family has a happy ending. Um, my parents committed a lot to making sure that my brother could get into rehab. Um, cost a lot. He got into a treatment center, got into sober living, um, and is now working at the sober house that he lived in. I actually just before session went out and visited him and was just, it was amazing. He was a different person. Mm -hmm. um, his color was back. He <laughs> weighed more. Um, and and the, the support system that he has through that, but my story could have been so much worse. Um, 
the people that I worry about are the ones that don't have that support system, mm -hmm. that don't have the financial means to put their loved ones into rehab, um, that don't have the family there around them to support them. Maybe their families are uh, addicts, but th that's what this bill is, is making sure that those people that don't have that support system can have a support system. And I just really want to thank you guys for, for bringing this forward. Um, this is life or death. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And before I give uh, Representative Baker my question, I want to ask and talk to the people that are our members, people watching in the audience and listening. And, and frankly, it's easy to argue about the particulars in this bill or another. But there is no argument that this is not an important issue and that when we discuss what we don't like I want everyone to think about what can we do I want everyone to contact someone on the committee contact the author of the bill with ideas of what we can do and that be our focus and not the disagreement on any specific thing here because we had the crack epidemic the meth problem was horrible in Minnesota. We came together and did things on, on the meth just a few years ago that helped. So let's, let's focus on that. Uh, Representative Baker, I know it's difficult and I want to thank you because this changes lives and saves lives, what, what you're doing. And there are two things. One, in, in the future, long term, uh, pharmacological genomics is something we got to try and, and fund to be able to help prevent people that have susceptibilities or issues or get the best pain, pain medication. But in reference to your bill, there, there's stuff about the, the monitoring and uh, you know, tying the prescription monitoring together. And I think that every uh, hospital and clinic They've got that health, electronic health records. They've got prescription, um, you know, integral into that. And I think we ought to look at asking and, and they requiring that if they're going to have electronic health work, record software products sold here, that they be compatible with our prescription monitoring and, and I think, you know, cover some of that cost and I'd love the pharmaceuticals to uh, uh, companies to come forward and maybe with some grants and uh, you know on their own help fund. But uh, if you can talk about how we can try to partner with or you know help make things easier and more compatible with the systems that are <coughs> present. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam. I think you're asking great questions about. Uh, part of my bill's desire is to make sure that, that every health record in the exam rooms are going to be integrated with a current program we have in the state, which is the prescription monitoring program. We have a vendor that has been very successful in 23 other states. Um, we have a price to have that done now in Minnesota, but we had, don't have the funds for that through the Board of Pharmacy. So that will be one of our very top priorities if we can find that funding is to try to get that integrated because our providers are looking for that tool to quickly look at uh, is a patient very vulnerable for substance abuse. Right now it's there, but it's about a five minute process. And so with a new integration, it'll be 15 seconds. It isn't mandating them to do it, but other states have shown when you give them this new tool, their, their participation rate with uh, the, looking at the PMP goes from 40 to 50% to 85, 90%, just because they need it and they have it quick. So that's one of our highest priorities. We're gonna work really hard on that, Representative Quam. Thank you, Representative Baker, Representative Quam. And members, this has been a uh, more robust discussion than even I was anticipating. The intent will be to lay over the bill today. Uh, we are running up on time on the uh, committee before we bring that up. I want to make sure that uh, we give the last uh, two to three minutes for anyone who is planning to testify who is from out of town so they don't have to make the trip back uh, when we bring the bill up again. Uh, so Mr. Jensen, thank you for your testimony today. And if there is anyone else who is not a regular around here who wishes to testify on the bill,
today, that would be appreciated. Representative Freiberg. Uh, there's an amendment in the packet. I was just wondering if we were going to take that up. The amendment will come when we bring the bill up again. Okay. If there are any out-of-town testifiers who would like to make their way down, we only have a couple of minutes left, but if you could please state your name and briefly give your testimony, that would be appreciated. Mr. Chair? Representative Liebling. Sorry, just before, as they're getting settled, could I just ask what the Chair's intention is with the bill? Are you planning to bring it up on another day and, can, and take a vote on it? or? We'll be laying it over for now and then uh, continue to work on it, and um, I, there's more discussion that needs to be done on the bill so we can make the appropriate changes before we advance it to the next committee. And Mr. Chair, are you planning to have an omnibus bill that this maybe would be part of? or Not that... at the moment, no. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record. And again, we are very pressed for time. Yes, I am Dr. Heather Bell. Uh, thank you for letting me have a chance to speak. Um, I know Representative Baker very well. I am a family physician in Little Falls, Minnesota in Morrison County, which is a small county. We have worked with uh, Representative Krishna, Representative Baker for the last couple of years and have actually started a couple of programs um, that address the root that we feel is the root of the problem, which is prescribers, um, doctors like myself prescribing because of information that we've all heard multiple times now that they were given. Um, we have a couple of programs that address all the questions that have been brought up today. It addresses education, it addresses prevention, it addresses the schools, and it addresses child protection, it addresses jails and people going in and out of jail. Um, one program we have is called Project ECHO. So every week, um, my partner and myself and our team in Little Falls get online and do a teaching. We teach communities throughout our state. Yesterday, we had 47 different clinics throughout the state of Minnesota, mostly rural, but also urban as well. Um, 46 people on our, um, on our clinic. What we do in our clinics every week is we teach. We teach about the CDC guidelines, the state guidelines. We teach about the problems with prescription drug use. We teach the guidelines as far as appropriate prescribing, uh, responsible prescribing. Um, we go through patient charts and say, you know, this patient doesn't really have a reason to be on these pain meds. Um, we get patients down to safe doses. Um, we, we teach them how to then become rural suboxone prescribers, buprenorphine prescribers, to treat these patients once they're addicted. Um, you can't, you know, we've heard a lot, you can't just take all the pills away, although that needs to happen. You need to treat this whole generation of people who are addicted. There's just not access to treatment. We've heard it time and time again, there's no access to treatment. Um, in our clinic, which is small, we have 53 patients currently on suboxone in our clinic. They eventually do go to treatment, part of our program, but we get them sober most times before they actually go to treatment. Um, about 80% of our patients are normal members of society, pay, taxpayers, they have full-time jobs, they have their families, their kids are not in child protection. Um, and so right now, I'm up here with Representative Baker saying this money would fund programs like ours to continue to do everything that's been said, help educate prescribers, help get into the schools, we do school presentations help the jails, um, treat patients when they're incarcerated, um, and then treat the addicts once they're out. Um, so that's what this money would fund, um, would be programs like ours that actually address the solutions to all of these um, very sad situations. Thank you, Dr. Bell, for your testimony. If there are questions for Dr. Bell, I'd ask that you please take them offline uh, for today. And thank you for your testimony here. It looks like we have one last testifier uh, before we adjourn today. Welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record. We are now four minutes over time, but um, I'd like to give you a moment. Um, my name is Thomas Anderson. I do apologize that we've gone over the time limit, but uh, I do want to say that family members are losing loved ones every single day. They're having ceremonies every single day for loved ones that are passing every day. So this is all I wanted to say so that way Lance can speak. If you want to know how and what the problem with the addiction is and where that part starts where you can intervene and step in and do something about it or where it goes so far that you're, you're, there's nothing left to do is basically how he was saying, talk to the people that have been through it. Put them in the positions where they're sitting there talking with the people that don't understand and so that way they can, they can get that knowledge and that wisdom from the people that actually have experienced it got past it, been out of prison, been able to stay sober, no matter all the obstacles they're thrown at them. 
that's all I wanted to say is bring those people together, let them talk to each other so you guys can get that knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record. I'm James Cross, uh, founder of Natives Against Heroin. We support this bill. Yep. Thanks. It's an important bill. Natives Against Heroin, we're talking for the Natives communities, reservations that are three times likely with ODs and deaths. Uh, we need change. We're doing it from about, we're doing from the boots on the ground. We're going to those dope houses to tell them to shut it down. We're pushing those people out of the communities. We're giving the addicts uh, resources, uh, like um, working with um, the Rumbler Foundation, Valhalla, uh, Narcan saves lives. We need this. We need you guys to really open up your mind and your hearts. And remember, life's over politics. Don't wait till this hits your house to change. This, this, this poison, this addiction, doesn't matter where it goes. We need change. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Baker, can you top that final I, word? I really can't, but I will tell you this. I know we have other people that do want to talk, but we don't have the time today because there's another committee coming in. But thank you. Um, there is a flaw with my bill, Mr. Chair, so I'm glad you're holding it over, laying it over, because I have the need is to be get there quickly with this funding, and this, this, this stewardship fee is a little bit delayed. Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to lay it over so we can make it a little bit better and come back to you again. Thank right. you. With that, I will move to lay the bill over. And with that, members, we are adjourned.